Hey everyone, this is Mike Katzman and welcome to the 2019 CFE Prep webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out tonight and attending this really important um, you know, class. And um, I just want to say thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules. Um, before we get started here, I always like to do a quick sound check to make sure everyone's able to follow along, everyone's able to hear me. Um, if you can hear me, could you please click on your chat? Typically the chat is at the bottom or um, to the right of your screen, depending on how your window is arranged. And could you please let me know if you're able to hear me and if you can see the slide on your screen. So on the screen, you should have 2019 CFE prep, what to study, and uh, you should be able to hear my voice. And if you can hear me, please let me know if you find the audio and video quality acceptable, um, perhaps by saying, hey, this is 10 out of 10 or nine out of 10, and then we can kind of get started from here. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Shiva. Th thank you, Rajesh. Um, thank you very much, Priya. Um, okay, yeah. <laughs> lots, lots of people are, are saying hello. So, um, yeah, so thank you again for taking the time um, to attend this session. I'm going to try to keep it really interesting. It's going to be a little different than what we've done in the past. And my role for today is just to kind of be a facilitator around the kind of content that you should be aware of for the 2019 CFE. Um, also, there's been some new updates, and I like to use this session a lot for kind of for updates and things that are really critical. So we're going to talk a lot about updates and things that you should probably know if you're writing the 2019 exam, okay? So if you're writing the 2019 CFE, this is a perfect session for you. I'm going to cover a lot here. Uh, and we'll kind of take a, a bit of a writing a twist to this particular session. Um, it's not going to focus as much about what you'll find, um, it, but it will focus a lot more on some of the recent questions that I've been getting. I've been getting lots of people by email, emailing me, asking me about like, how do I get started? How do I start writing? Um, how do I improve my writing now, like in April, not necessarily later on in the process, but like, how do I do it right now? How do I maximize all my available options, et cetera? So a lot of what you know, a lot of what we're going to cover today will be linked to these particular questions that I've just discussed. Okay, um, this particular session is scheduled for for approximately two hours, and we might end a little early, depending on how many questions you all have. By the way, if you ever have any questions throughout this presentation, feel free to jot down your questions in the chat box. So you can communicate with me live. I do monitor the questions throughout the whole presentation. So feel free to let me know if there's anything at all that comes to mind. I may periodically pause and stop and allow for a certain, you know, I guess topic to pass before we actually move forward, just in the interest of being fair to everyone. And I might be covering the same topic that you're talking about later on in the process. So without further ado, I'd like to get started here. Again, welcome to the 2019 CFE Prep What to Study session. Um, this is April 16th, Tuesday. Um, thank you very much for, for joining me today. Uh, before we get started, I just like to do a quick um, kind of, you know, I'd like to explain a little bit about my uh, my background. Um, I'm Mike Katzman. I'm the course director at Prep Formula. In the past, I've been a CPA marker for CPA Canada as part of the day two, five hour comprehensive case. Um, so in other words, I'm a marker uh, that did a lot of work prior to being at Prep Formula for CPA Canada. And a lot of what I talk about is often sharing best practices, uh, case writing best practices that I've noticed while being in the marking center. Previous to that, I was involved with York University's Atkinson program and with my old firm at ENY. Um, in general, what we're going to cover today will focus on supplementary information because Pre Prep Formula provides supplementary training um, above and beyond what CP Canada provides. We do not duplicate questions. We don't duplicate what they say. We don't teach the CPA way. We teach something that we think is, is a better approach for how you maximize the time available. And a lot of what, what we teach is strictly exam oriented. In other words, it is CPA Canada's mission to educate you to be a better accountant. It is my mission to help you pass the exam. So my focus is entirely different compared to what CPA Canada might do for you. And what you'll find is a lot of the material that we'll cover will be from the standpoint of how to do better from an exam context, not necessarily how to do better from an accounting learning context. 
So again, my job is to teach you to pass the exam, not necessarily teach you to be a better accountant. That's not my role, that's CP Canada's role. So um, we've been really successful at doing what, what we do. I had approximately a 90% pass rate for the 2017 CP and 88% pass rate for, for the 2018 based, based on all three days. Um, and then from 2015 until now, we've been the largest in most trusted CPA prep program in Canada based on site traffic. So it's four years straight um, with up to 50,000 site visits a month. So thank you all of you for attending these sessions to make this happen. And many of you may know that we teach these sessions twice a week at least uh, live. They're always approximately Tuesday and Thursday night. Uh, they're very easy to tune in and all of them are always recorded. So they're always recorded. You can always come back. You can watch an, another one on any topic. Uh, the reason why we do this is because this helps me encourage you to get started earlier. So you kind of know what to do. And I find the consistency really helps people stay on top of it. You know what I mean? Like there are a thousand reasons why I should not go to the gym today. Okay. I can think of a thousand reasons, but if I'm, uh, if I'm with you every single day, if I'm with you every single week, and you know that you have to attend a session, it makes it a whole lot easier to, you know, prepare yourself at least mentally for the CV. So that's kind of, you know, the point of these sessions. So by the way, um, I always like to do a quick, uh, you know, disclaimer, feel free to read this in your own time, but uh, basically you should probably read this to make sure that, uh, that you understand. But a lot of it comes down to basically, this is my, my own personal opinion and all rights are reserved. Um, and essentially that the advice provided below is provided for illustrative purposes and not necessarily advice or, or guidance, okay? Um, we do have our, you know, we, you know, we're happy to provide advice within a one-on-one -on -one context, uh, but unfortunately I can't provide advice to everyone in the room because there's a lot of people here. So um, what do I wanna talk about today? First of all, we're going to talk about some very commonly appearing topics on the CFI. And you might ask why. Well, chances are that if you understand the commonly tested topics from 2015, 16, 17, 18, if you understand the previous tested topics, then you have a good chance of doing well for 2019 because what you'll notice is CPA Canada releases the same kind of context. Uh, we're also going to look at case writing holistically Based off of these topics, I will prove to you which particular areas you should focus on. And I will really show you that the same topics constantly appear over and over and over. So we'll actually tackle a case together. I'll try to kind of do my best to show you how I read through cases and how I interpret information. And hopefully you can learn something from that. And then I have three particular examples of student responses and we're going to mark them together and we're, you know, we're going to debrief them through the chat. Okay, so that's quite an agenda for today. Um, I, I hope to kind of fly through it. Again, if you have any questions at all, please let me know and please feel free to kind of interrupt me at any point, okay? So um, let's first start with case writing stuff and why this is critical. So I just, you know, you know I'm the kind of person that likes to kind of get right to it so what I'd like to show you on your screen is you may have seen me prepare a document like this before. Um, for those of you that have attended my previous sessions, what I tend to do is set up a document that basically lists the previous sessions that have been available and have been, sorry, uh, the, the uh, previous assess, assessment opportunities on previous exams. And I like to kind of suggest particular topics to focus on. Um, I also like to provide pass rates. So as the first order of business for today, I know a lot of you might be thinking, well, why are we talking about pass rates right away? Well, you're, all of you are here because you wanna pass the exam. And I understand that. And all of you are also here because you wanna learn something new that you probably haven't seen before. You, I mean, you can read a lot about Capstone 1. You can read a lot about Capstone 2 online, but you probably can't read what I'm going to tell you. And what I'm trying to sort of give you here is a marker's input into what you should be studying. You know, I often get this question, what should I study? How do I prepare? Um, that, it's a fairly difficult question to answer. And hopefully I will sort of explain a little bit 
about what you need to do. Let me first summarize by saying that in order to prepare for the CFE, you kind of have to get rid of all the previous ideas that you know that you had before. So um, let's for a second, and actually maybe I should ask you this question, folks. So what is your background? So um, what I'd like for you to do, and I, I realize that there's quite a few people in the room, but let's try this, okay? Uh, please state whether you're uh, CPA module candidate, so basically did CPA PEP, or internationally trained, okay, or master's student. Which route are you? So please feel free to tell me in the chat right now um, which particular route you went through. And then I will try to tailor what I'm doing just to explain a little bit more about why this is relevant, um, just so I kind of have an idea, okay? And then by the way, for all of you folks, you can also see exactly which route other people were doing. So you kind of have an idea around where to go from here. Okay, so, so far I'm seeing lots of people who did CPA PEP. Um, lots of people are saying that, uh, actually there, I'm seeing a couple of people that are, that are saying that they were internationally trained. Um, any master's students in here? Just kind of out of curiosity. Uh, CP PEP experience route. Okay, I see. So what you'll find is the overall majority of the people in the room are kind of a combination of CPA PEP and from what I could see, a little bit of people in that are internationally trained. Okay, so this is really critical, I would say for everyone. Oh, there we go. We have we have a master's student. Welcome. Um, welcome to all of you, by the way. I, I think it's important for you to kind of get all of this so let me say this if you are a cpa pep student and you're watching this i'm just going to say that the cfe is completely different than what you've seen before the main reason for that is unlike what you did as part of pep there's now a new level so breadth and depth is no longer the only relevant area uh, you now have to do something called sufficiency sufficiency is an average across all your aos so what do i mean by that well now the exam across day two and day three actually kind of, you know, you're supposed to take an average of all areas. So for example, if I was to look at, you know, the competence and competence with distinction across all particular areas, and I try to summarize what this might be, I can sort of calculate an average here, okay, just by highlighting this column, and I get, a, I get an approximate average of 66% if I was to highlight everything involved. Now, why is this relevant? Well, because this is a highly standardized exam. And what you need to sort of understand is you kind of have to be a little bit above average to pass. And that's what sufficiency is. Now, for those of you that are internationally trained or those of you that are master's students, this applies to both people. So the capstone people, the internationally trained people, and the master's students that did not go through PEP. What you have to look at here is um, basically throughout your preparation so far, you have had varying levels of exposure. So for example, the, the internationally trained community, um, you probably don't quite know exactly which technical topic to start with. And what you've looked at so far is you've tried to analyze however many topics are available in the competency map. And you've tried to look at the handbook and try to determine how many topics are, are available. And one of the critical things about why this is important is CPA Canada cannot possibly test every single topic in the handbook. Uh, they can also, you know, they also cannot test every variation, every permutation of those topics. So it would be practically impossible. Um, what they test instead is kind of frequently tested topics that appear year after year, okay? So um, so for anyone who's internationally trained, kind of hang on and I'll explain what I'm doing here. Um, for those of you that are master's students, so you kind of want to move away from the idea of um, individual topics being tested as part of one course. So one of the challenges of a, a master's program is you had fairly limited exposure to 
um, collective subjects. So like in other words, you may have had a case writing course where you've actually practiced cases. But outside of this, you probably took individual courses, for example, financial accounting, management accounting, et cetera, that taught you individual subjects. One of the challenges that you'll face here is one particular case might be on a number of different subjects. So one of the biggest challenges that you'll find is how to sort of adjust for talking about different subjects. And by the way, for all three of you, okay, so for all three categories, CPA PEP, Masters, Internationally Trained, you are all essentially writing the same exam. So if you look around here, if you look at the chat at the moment, what you'll find is there is a combination of different backgrounds. But you got to remember that this exam is highly standardized. So what do I mean by this? Why do I keep saying highly standardized, etc.? What you have on your screen is actual pass rate data based on each competency area. What is a competency area? A competency area is a subject area, okay? So for example, financial reporting, aka financial accounting, is a subject area, right? So, so here we have a subject area, right? Here I've highlighted it in yellow. And here's management accounting, another subject area. Now within each subject area, and by the way, I apologize if I'm going through this a little slower. I just wanna make sure everyone's on the same page. Within each subject area, we have a, an you know, a grouping of individual things for you to do. So for example, in this case, see inventory, you had to discuss inventory as part of an assessment opportunity. Like an assessment opportunity means something for you to do. So you had to discuss inventory as part of this financial reporting. So the category is financial like reporting or accounting. And by the way, there's, there's six categories. I hope you all know that. And within each topic, right, within each thing f like for you to do, you'll have one particular, you know, area for you to focus on. And we're going to kind of tackle and we'll look at an example in a second. But all I wanna show you here is in 2015, when they released the exam, they started providing these type of graphs. Um, and by the way, this comes from the CFE reports. Um, so technically speaking, you can find this on your own as well, but I just wanna explain. For each individual topic, like for each individual subject, for each competency area, um, you can find which particular areas were tested. So for financial accounting, you can see what was tested, right? Inventory, revenue recognition, research and like research and development, which which uh, by the way is intangible assets, right? Discontinued operations, which is property plan and equipment, and then we had some kind of a overall adjustment, and then we had revenue again, and then we had intangibles again. Now, do you notice that revenue was tested twice? So this guy, right, this was revenue, <laughs> was tested twice on one exam. Interesting, right? And then intangibles was also tested twice, right? Research and development and then intangibles. So what's interesting to me is even within one exam, they could have picked from thousands of topics available, but yet they picked two very common ones and they repeated them over and over and over again. Do you see that? So these are all the topics that appeared on the CV. Now let's change tabs here for a second and we'll go to 2016 and I wanna show you something else that happened. This is 2016 now, revenue recognition, then we have cost of sales, warranty, which is some kind of a liability. Then we have lawsuits, so this is new stuff, okay? Then we have development costs again, which by the way is another in intangible topic. Right? Then we have covenant and boring base like calculation. Then we have a little bit about goodwill. And then we have land exchange, which is again property, plant, and equipment. Do you notice that at least a decent amount of these have been tested in the past? Right? So three, at least I would say, okay, at least three subjects were tested in 2015 that were tested in 2016. Okay? Now there were only seven areas, so that's a, that's approximately just under 50% of topics. So just under 50% of topics were tested year after year, right? Do you see this, right? Now let's go to 2017. Now many of you know that I have used this spreadsheet before to show people that this is all possible, this is all doable. Let's compare 2016 and, and 2017. Revenue recognition, by the way, has now appeared so many times it appeared on every exam crowdfunding which is also revenue recognition in this case appeared again 
Okay, so again, we have a double revenue, right, which happened in 2015 and once on 2016. Here we have an impairment lawsuit. Lawsuit happened here, right? Lawsuit happened two years in a row now. And here we have a non-monetary transaction, like an impairment, and then key ratios. Ratios, by the way, happened in, in 2015. That's your adjusted financial statement uh, balance. So you kind of have an idea. Um, some, uh, so so uh, someone's asking, is there a way to get the spreadsheet? I find it informative. Yeah, of course, I will upload all the materials that I will be discussing tonight, um, and, and I will make them available as soon as we're done this session, okay? So you don't have to ask for it. It will be available, I promise you. I will upload it at the end of the session. Um, and then I'm getting another question. Is this mostly IFRS or ASPE? Well, you don't really know because you have to know both. You, ha you have to know both. In my experience, they kind of go 50-50. So th there's no way of picking one or another. Now, many of you know, by the way, that I've given away this spreadsheet before, and I believe a lot in it strictly because on the right side of your page, you can actually now see pass rate data. So you can see how an average person did, right? Competent means that the person did well. Competent with, with a distinction is like, to me, the equivalent of overcooked. Okay, it's too well. You don't want to be in competence with distinction, but basically it's it, it's the same level. Reaching is kind of halfway there, and then anything that's NA or NC is bad. Okay, and that's something that's super critical. Now, many of you have watched me do this session quite a bit, and I've talked about this spreadsheet continuously from 2015, 16, 17. And now you see that this was you know repeated, but for the first time ever, I actually have an updated spreadsheet for 2018. Because CPA Canada, uh, you know, recently came out with the 2018 uh, CFI guide, which now made this available for me to explore and talk about with you. So here's a couple of things. If we look at 2018, and by the way, this is the first time that anyone in this room has ever seen this. Okay, so I'm unveiling it live, um, so you, so you kind of have an idea. Revenue recognition again, <laughs> four years in a row, is there? How crazy is that? Warranty. Warranty, remember, appear in 2016, right? 2016. Huh. Business combination. So business combination, it sounds like it's a new topic, but it's actually not a new topic because it was goodwill. It was found here in 2016 as well. Okay. Now we have equipment componentization, which is property, plant, and equipment, which has appeared again before. Uh, and then we have EPS, which is a new topic completely. This was not tested before. And then we have leases. Now, please understand that these two topics were new. So in other words, four topics, right? These four topics were a repeat of previous years. And these two were new. Greater than 50% of the exam, greater than 50% of the exam was not new stuff. Isn't that crazy? Now, what if I told you, <laughs> what if I told you that the same is true if we look at other competency areas? Would you think that I'm crazy? Well, if I had to be a betting man, <laughs> or if you had to be someone who enjoyed gambling, you'd probably want to bet on me now, <laughs> okay? So just to show you that I'm not full of it, I just want to show you so you have an idea, so you, so you kind of understand. So someone's asking me what was asked in business combinations. I, I, this is not the point of this. Um, the point isn't for me to explain what the cases were. It's strictly just to show you that it's the same topics being tested. Okay, you, you are welcome to open up the the uh, 2018 CFI and then you can check out what you know you know you know what was tested. To me, that's not as 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 relevant. Um, so you probably don't want to know. And then, and then there's a follow-up question. Were consolidated financial statements prepared? Um, again, not relevant for what we're talking about, but you're welcome to look it up, okay? This is public information. But let's just, for simplicity, what I wanna show you is let's pick another competency area. I'm just gonna be, you know, I'll go very simple. I'll pick assurance, okay? Um, take a look at assurance in 2015. We have income statement analysis, we have ratios, we have risk, materiality and approach, procedures, errors, and then IPO, which is by the way, again, procedures. So IPO was actually procedures twice. So that's your procedures. Um, take a look at, at, at 2016 now. We have engagement issues, 
risk, right? Covered in last year, materiality and audit approach covered before. Analytical review, it sounds like it's different, but it's actually not quite different. It was your basically income statement analysis. It's very similar to that kind of analysis. It's just an analytical review. So test it again. Procedures, test it, test it before. We have nothing here about you know internal controls. So this is sort of a new topic. And then also reports are, um, and what, by the way, what they mean here is special reports. So it's something a little different. And, and by the way, engagement issues was, it's not clear from here, but it was actually related to the risk approach, et cetera. Like, so all of these were actually part of the same area and it was a repeat of what was happening before. So really what we, you had here is a total of seven areas, okay? Out of which five were, you know, repetitive. In, in terms of the kind of way that you would answer the question from before. If we go to 2017, well, you probably now understand that um, we're going to have quite a bit. Independence was the same idea as in engagement issues from, from 2016. Um, risk, same, your uh, materiality, same. Procedures, same, right? We talked about procedures. Internal controls, same, 2016. Reports, same. Report procedures. Well, procedures weren't directly tested here. So I'm just gonna say on the fence, but sort of because procedures were actually tested in 2015 here. So I'll just say same. You see, we only had one particular area that was new. And keep in mind, 40% of people here, you can see here, right? 40% of people still got it right. <laughs> anyway, and then again, uh, this is all new stuff, so I just kind of want to show you. 2018, let's look at what you, know, what you found on 2018. Risk, same. Materiality approach, same. Inventory procedures, procedures were tested again. Reliance on expert, new. Okay, new stuff. And by the way, again, it was done actually very well. 63% of people did well. Procedures on accounting issues, same. Summary of misstatements, kind of new. IT controls. And then a, a, a review of interim financial statements, which by the way, is basically just income statement analysis. So again, we had eight topics here, right? We had eight topics, six of which were identical to previous years. So in other words, what I just want to convey here is you should be very careful around how to score well and there should be no reason why you don't know which areas to study. Because if I provide you with this spreadsheet, you can find classes on the prep formula system that for example, cover revenue recognition. You can find a revenue recognition course, right? You can find a business combination class. You can find a property plan and equipment class. You can find an earnings per share class or a leases class. Similarly, if you go and discuss any kind of management accounting, we have management accounting classes, right? We have things that talk about audit and assurance. We have things that talk about equity and, 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 and finance stuff. We have, we have lots of tax material, okay? So I think you kind of get the point, right? Um, and by the way, for those of you that are wondering like, oh, by the way, what if my elective role is not assurance? So Mike, I, I understand that you looked at assurance here, but should I care? Well, if you look at the breadth test, which by the way, every single writer does, as you can see day three in 2018, for example, focus on strategy and governance, audit and assurance. So yes, you have to do audit. Okay, as you can see, here it is. Three AOs in audit. You have to do it. You, you have to know it. Um, also three in finance and three in tax. So if you think that you can get away without knowing tax, you're wrong. You have to know tax, you have to know audit, at least these areas, okay? So in other words, you can structure a, a schedule for yourself based off of previous information and try to keep the spreadsheet as a checklist, okay? As, you know, as a basic checklist of areas that you think that, that you've covered or did not cover. Any questions here? Any questions here so far? Any 
um, it, it, is this helpful? Is it kind of like you, you know, do you kind of get, you know, ideas now? Do you understand a little bit more about how to focus on what could be potentially tested? Is this somewhat helpful, very helpful, moderately helpful, extremely helpful? Let me know. I just kind of want to get a sense of, you know, what, like whether you understand what to do with this information and if you know how to proceed from here. So, so how do you feel about this so far? Do you, you know, do you find this helpful? Let me know in the live chat. Um, I just kind of see if, if everyone's on the same page. Okay. Um, so by the way, someone's asking me how to, you know, you know, how does level of, of four work? Um, that's a really good question. So level four basically is something that is, um, here, I, well, in order for me to talk about level four, um, I actually have, I actually have to talk about level one, two, three, and four, and I'll actually show you all of them. And you'll kind of have an idea based off of all levels. Okay, so let's, like, by the way, pick a very simple year. We'll pick, I don't know, 2015. Um, level one, remember there is a bunch of levels. We have level one. Here, I'm just going to type on your side of your screen here. We have level one, level two, level three, and level four. So this is the levels to passing 2019 CV. Yay. So... The first level is called sufficiency, but forget about the word sufficiency. Ugh, I don't like it. Just use average. It's way more, you know, it, it's a better explanation of, of uh, what it is. Here, just in brackets, just so no one tears my head off later. We have sufficiency here. Okay, it is sufficiency. <laughs> okay, now the other area is depth, and then you have to achieve depth in financial reporting and management accounting. So you're immediately evaluated for both, but you basically have to get one, okay? You have to get one of these, correct. So get one um, depth area, at least. Does that make sense? So you're, you're immediately tested for both, okay? For both of these in depth, and then you have to get one. Then you have depth in your elective role. So if someone's asking me, is your elective role weighted more? Yes, because you have another level called level three depth in your elective. Therefore, by you know naturally, there's like a separate level where you, you know that information is uh, tested at a higher level. And then for anything that's not tested here, basically this is a catch-all, catch-all, okay, category. The CPA Canada causes breadth. I don't know what the word breadth even means, okay? I mean, I do. I'm just, I, I'm trying to make a joke, okay? But, like, the point is, think of it as a catch-all category. So, in other words, if your competency area, right, was not tested, right, CA is competency area, is not tested in any of level two or three, it falls here. Okay, so if, if you don't have to do depth in an area, then it becomes breadth. So let me explain a little bit more about what all this stuff even means. But just so you know, like, here's what we're talking about. So all of these, by the way, is an average. Here, I'll kind of do this. Um, how to pass. By the way, I'll, I'll, I'll provide all this for you, okay? How to pass. So in this particular level, minimum uh, average across AOs. So your average across AOs has to be higher than another person. That's how you pass, you know, here for level two, you, you need minimum number of Cs. By the way, C means a competent mark in area right in area aka like ie fr okay now this is minimum number of c's but your elective and then then and then you have minimum one c in any other area tested 
okay? So you kind of have an idea of, of how these are now tested. So now let's let's take a look at both. Oh, by the way, I'm seeing lots of questions. I think I think it's going to help you. I think this is going to help you more as you just watch me do it. Minimum average across all AOs. So let me give you an example. What I want to do now is highlight everything that was tested on the actual exam. So I'll kind of highlight all of this. Assume for a second that, that all the roles have the same weighting. So we'll just highlight all of that. And then we'll take everything else. So we'll call, we'll basically highlight this whole column. We get an approximate average here of 65%. So, it, so in other words, if you're significantly below 65% on average, then you probably fail level one. If you're kind of at the 65% range, then you probably pass. If you're above 65% overall, then you're fine. Now, if you start getting a bunch of zeros here, like if you're hitting a bunch of NAs or NCs, this is how you get a zero and this is how you fail level one. Now, keep in mind in your depth area, um, we need um, under level two, we need a minimum number of Cs in one particular area. So take a look at this particular example. Let's look at you know financial reporting for, our, for 2015. If we were to summarize this whole area and what I've quickly done here is I've taken an average of this, okay? We get 56%. So let's now look at a minimum number of Cs. So anything above 56% will not be highlighted. Anything below it will be highlighted. So in other words, there were on the exam seven opportunities for you to score a C on, okay? And basically you need approximately four of them, four out of seven to pass right because the average person got four right so which means that if you get three right you are likely to fail if you get two right you're probably going to fail if you got four you're fine if you got five and higher you're great so, it's, 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 so that's level two same goes for your elective role if you take a look at your overall average we have 57 percent Right? Everything is standardized here. You need four out of seven for you to pass because anything above that is four and then you have three that are significantly below. So the expectation is probably four out of seven Cs for you to pass. And then for your breadth area, you kind of just need one. Okay, so if you really mangle something, right? The average here is 80%. So the average person gets all of them right. But for example, like if you miss one or, you know, basically level four is pretty easy to get most people get the level four, okay? And for those of you that are asking, what topics am I potentially tested on? Well, I mean, it's the same idea, right? So the level four topics are actually found below. You can find all of them here. Strategy and governance, audit, finance, tax. Same for 2016, you scroll down to the bottom, you see the level four topics. In general, they're very similar to the elective role. It's just that they are tested at a slightly lower level of difficulty. So yes, you have to know all of this. You have to know all these areas. And the purpose of the spreadsheet is just to kind of give you a little bit of general guidance. Okay, I, I hope that this kind of makes some more sense now. Now, does this, I just wanna now pause here for a second again. Is this more clear, less clear? Am I helping people with their questions? If you still have a question, feel free to jot it down in the chat and we can kind of take it from here. Um, so by the way, Sita is asking is C 65% or how much other students scored? Um, C is not 65%. C has nothing to do with 65%. When I was talking about 65%, it linked to level one. It was strictly an average of all AOs across the exam. That's what it was. So I just want to make sure that you understand that. Okay. Okay, cool. So as long as you understand this strategy, that's all you gotta know. <laughs> okay, that's all you gotta know. Um, the reason why I'm doing this again is the purpose of all of this is just to give you some guidance around you know what to do. Okay, so I will upload this. Um, you'll have it available, and I just really want to make sure. Um, uh, by the way, Lourdes is asking what a, uh, you know what is levels one, two, and four. Um, I just talked about them, so feel free to rewind later. You can rewatch this presentation as well. It, it's available, so so you'll have an idea, okay? There are levels above and beyond that. Okay, so 
and by the way, folks, like um, there's absolutely nothing, you know, I'm not giving away this, you know, the state secrets here. A lot of this is public information. And I just want to, you know, help you understand it more. I want to help you understand it so you, so you kind of have an idea. Okay, so I'm getting a couple of questions here. Uh, Beanish, can we say that we have to study more for the electives? I'm, I'm going to say yes. Well, because you, it's not more for the electives. It's, it's you have to know all these areas, right? So Beanish, go through all four years and create a list of topics. That's what you have to study, Beanish, right? A list of all four years worth of topics. Monica. Uh, does assurance role equal depth for a financial re like reporting needed or can you get it in management accounting instead? Uh, Monica, great question. Depend depending on why you're asking me this question. Monica, if you intend to get a public accountant's license, okay, this is only relevant for anyone who wants to get a PAL, a public accountant's license, then you have to get both depth in financial re like reporting and assurance. It cannot be management accounting. You could do financial reporting, management accounting, and assurance, like depth in all three, but you cannot miss the financial reporting if you want to get a PAL. Otherwise, it's financial reporting. If you don't want to get a, a, a public accounts uh, license, then it could be either financial reporting or management accounting to pass uh, uh, you know, level two. Um, Manpreet, can day three help and achieve level three in elective? Yes, absolutely. So that's actually what I was going to say. Day three is actually the best way to learn for your elective because if you practice a bunch of day three cases, it's much more manageable. Like a person can do tons and tons and tons of day three cases and learn all the subject areas because it would be absolutely crazy for you to write one of those five, you know, like five hour cases a couple times a week. So the best way to prepare is by really doing a bunch of practice questions, day three, you know, like practice questions on these topics, right? On your elective area topics. Uh, Delphine, just to confirm these levels are associated with day two and three, right? Um, yes, so, so this is strictly, day, you know, day two and three. Uh, for any day one stuff, we have a separate presentation. Um, and it just covers uh, day one, so so this is this has nothing to do with day one. By the way, most people pass day one, so it's harder. Someone's asking where you know where do you get practice cases? Um, you get them either from your account or from your marker. Okay, folks. So I think that's pretty much it. Um, uh, by the way, if you know if you're not a prep formula student, uh, Nikita, um, you can get practice cases from us. Okay, so if you register as a student, you'll get practice cases for, for you know uh, from us. Th that's something that we do. Okay, um, perfect. Okay, folks. So let's um, let's get to a, a different point here. So as you can imagine, now that you know which subjects, okay, I, you know, I, I know that by the way, I'm rushing through it. I mean, we don't have a lot of time together. So I'm rushing through a lot of information and, and I'm dumping all this stuff on you. And you're probably thinking, oh my God, this guy just keeps talking. <laughs> okay. Um, there's so much information flying at you, but, but um, hopefully it's useful. And number two, hopefully you kind of have an idea of, of what to practice, even though you don't remember now, you can go back, you can download the spreadsheet, you can get it later. Cool. What I now want to talk about is once you actually get, you know, these areas, okay, these topics, what do you do? Well, the best way to prepare is actually by watching, you know, more prep formula classes under these topics, right? Like under these topics, right? So we have classes for these and then practicing cases that actually, you know, get you to write stuff. So what I want to do is kind of give you a brief overview. Okay. This is not as thorough as what you'll find later in the program. I just want to give you a rough overview of what you should study, right? Like what you should focus on um, and, and, and how to sort of do cases once you actually are ready to go in and do them. Okay. So, in general, how you write cases is, um, and by the way, sorry, I just want to, I, I just want to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Um, 
watching classes is cool. That's like 20% of the effort necessary to pass. Writing cases is like 80% of the effort necessary to pass. So um, that's one of the challenges that I find that it's easy to watch classes, but you kind of still have to do cases to actually pass. So that's 80% of the effort to pass. So how you write cases is by using the RODAC methodology. And by the way, RODAC is different than the CPA way. It's kind of a more streamlined version of it. So so, so here's kind of how I do it. Um, you read the case once, R, you organize using an outline, and we suggest a computer outline. Um, basically, it's like a skeleton of, of all your case, including all your, your information and themes. We absolutely do not recommend the paper outline, you know, the quadrant with the paper in the, you know, ugh, terrible. Um, I think it's not very effective given the time provided. Remember, the biggest challenge on this exam is time management. Um, so one of the critical parts is someone who's using a computer outline will be way faster than doing something on paper and then transposing all the information over it's crazy it's absolutely nuts so that's why i suggest that if you haven't tried a computer outline maybe you should okay maybe you should um, then you divide into competency areas so in your outline try to divide each individual topic into competency areas right so as you can see here Everything is neatly divided into competency areas, right? Your audit, your assurance, your your you know financial reporting, your management accounting, et cetera, right? So we neatly divide everything into competency areas, rank by importance, allocate time, and then apply a preferred format. So we teach a lot of formats. And by the way, there's a number of courses, uh, sorry, classes, I guess, within the program that actually teach how to structure formats. And you should watch that. They're all called RODAC. So you'll have an idea of, of how those work. And then you basically conclude by summarizing the big picture topic, right? Um, often people ask me, do we need the final one? Like, do you need to do the last one, um, that conclusion? I like to think yes, because it makes me understand that you get the point of the case. So that's something really critical. Okay, um, let me do a couple of questions here. Um, Gana, is day one presentation recording available to watch? Um, no, because it hasn't happened yet. Um, it's coming later. Marcus, is there more credit given for getting C's in common topics like revenue recognition um, in getting level two or are all AOs weighted the same? Marcus, all AOs are, are, have the same weighting. So be careful, be careful, okay? A lot of people believe that, you know, you spending more time in, in revenue recognition means that you actually get more, you know, more marks. As you can see here, Marcus, this is all the proof that you need, right? Everything is on one line item. There's absolutely no waiting. Okay, waiting is something that students uh, believe because it takes them longer to do a certain topic. But to me, that's crazy because, you know, CPA publishes data about what's possible and what's not, and they supply this data. In fact, no. So everything is weighted the, the exact same. Uh, Nikita, what do you... What do you do if you can't figure out which competency area it is? Um, usually, Nikita, you can kind of narrow it down to two different ones. And honestly, if you can't figure out which competency area it is, it's probably an issue of not enough case practice. So my advice is now you should do a lot of case practice and you'll get better at identifying. Okay, identification errors are common in the beginning. They're not really common towards the end of the process. I don't believe that you'll have this issue. Surrender, how do you use computer outline as question paper is given in a paper form? Surrender, well, r remember you are typing your response on a computer. So your computer outline basically is a skeleton version, right? Just like it says on your screen here. It's a skeleton version of the actual case. Like you, you start forming the case on, you, you know, it's a skeleton version that you just basically fill in the blank into on your computer as you're typing the actual response. I, I, I hope that kind of makes sense. Um, Tram, can we allow to download secure software so we can practice? Yeah, of course. Uh, it, it's already available. Uh, you, you should contact the CPA body for that. Um, surrender, should we conclude each AO? Yes, you should. Um, Michelle, are there multiple choice questions on the CFI or are they all cases? They are all 100% cases. There's no multiple choice questions, okay? Perfect. Okay, um, let's kind of 
you know, dive deeper from here. So now that you kind of have an idea about how to write cases, right? And how to organize stuff. This is kind of an idea of how you organize information. What I want to do is actually do a case with you folks, okay? And just maybe read it along with you so you kind of have an idea. This is a, uh, you know, this is our version of a case. Um, so you have an idea of, of what that may look like. So on your screen now, you will have a case called Comedy Hour. Okay, how many how many people can see me highlighting the words comedy hour? Okay, how many um how many people can see this comedy hour? So comedy hour is approximately a ninety minute case. What I want to do is just quickly identify some of the information um, that we talk about here. And I also want to show you a couple of sample cases. So, so here's some sample responses. We're going to look at them and we're going to debrief them or we're going to talk about them briefly. And then we'll basically end it off like for the evening. Okay. So just to kind of give you an, a basic idea. Um, let's, let's just read this along together. We'll try to identify areas and we'll, you know, for those of you that don't really have much exposure to cases, um, I'm going to show you an example. And um, I'm going to kind of explain what you could potentially see on a, a day three case. This is also extremely helpful for anyone who's doing the, you know, the assurance elective, because there's going to be a whole ton of assurance here. Okay, let's get started. Um, Shirley and Adam Whalen are the stars of the hit online podcast, Comedy Hour. The show provides a weekly dose of topical satire that manages to be both thought provoking and uproaringly uproariously funny. Wow, what a word. Um, and its target market is adults from 21 to 35 years old. Okay, so you kind of have numbers. You know, I, uh, by the way, folks, I always like to highlight numbers. They are always provided to us for a reason. Okay, uh, the show quickly gained most of its viewers through message boards and various internet sites and now runs in syndication in over 30 countries. So they're like global, right? The show is distributed online via the provider of on-demand internet streaming media like Netflix. So, okay, folks. So we have this TV show, okay, where it's one particular person that we, you know, that's sort of uh, looking at this. Um, and, you know, as you can see, this is kind of a newer case because it, it talks about topical issues like Netflix, which I think is kind of cool. Um, I'm, I'm noticing, uh, by the way, a question from a student here, Marcus. I'll, I'll get back to you in a second. I just want to quickly, um, you know, finish this and then I'll, I promise I will get back to you on your question, okay? Um, Comedy Hour Inc. produces and distributes the Comedy Hour show and is privately owned by Shirley and Adam. Each owns 50 common shares. Okay. So, by the way, as you can, uh, you know, understand, we have 100 total common shares and then 50-50 partners. Right, so you so you have, you know, an idea of what this is. CHI generates its, its revenues by distributing the Comedy Hour show and earning advertising revenue through the Comedy Hour website. Okay, so basically they have two revenue sources, right? Distributing the Comedy Hour show, right? So that's one revenue source, basically selling it to Netflix and then advertising on the Comedy Hour website. So if you understand what this means, basically they have they have two important revenue sources. Like that's it. This is how they make money, one or another. So for example, if there's a problem with distribution, then that'd be a huge problem. Or if there's a problem with the website, then there'd be a loss of revenue. Seacha has been profitable since its startup four years ago. Shirley and Adam have a guaranteed three-year contract beginning April 1st of 2020 for the Comedy Hour show with providers of on-demand internet streaming media and therefore expect the show revenue to grow at the same rate it's grown in 2015 sorry sorry 2019 excerpts from the unaudited financial statements um for the year end uh ended march 31 2018 and forecasted 2019 are found in exhibit one shirley and adam are heavily involved in the management of chi and as a result its operations have been described as smooth efficient and productive so naturally, we can see that things are going well for them, right? That's a huge bonus, right? 
we see that things are going very, very well for them. And we actually believe that, you know, they're they are pretty good at running this. Um, keep in mind, right, we have another explanation. I guess we have a further clarification, right, about how their, you know, how their revenue works, right? Um, so we have a, a three-year contract, right? Always highlight numbers, right? Three-year. So that's your dis that that's your distribution. So th they've signed some kind of an agreement where it's a three-year contract, and they kind of have to do something with this. Okay, so, so now you know what's happening. Given the immense uh, popularity of the show, Shirley and Adam decided in early November to market for the first time a line of products, including funky t-shirts, hoodies, and trademark photo frames through CHI. Because the internet played an integral role in their rise to fame, they have decided to sell their products on the Comedy Hour website. So by the way, so this is their advertising stuff. This is the, the other stuff. Remember, this stuff was covered by the three years, you know, contract, right? This is now their advertising revenue stuff and, and, and all the other things that they want to understand. Okay, so just to kind of give you an idea of, of uh, where it all fits. Okay, um, Shirley and Adam anticipate sales from these products to be four million. Okay, so... Okay, in the first year, 2020. However, the new venture is not expected to add significant profit to CHI as the main reason for the venture is to market Comedy Hour and extend this, you know, this uh, the series life. So remember, they only have a three-year contract, so they basically hope that if people buy stuff, they will like the show more. Okay, that's kind of where they want to go with this. Product sales are anticipated to grow at the same rate as existing CHI revenues. Okay, cool. Shirley and Adam want to focus on their production aspect of CHI, so they're going to outsource the merchandising operations. They've, they've been approached by Flip Deals Inc., FD, a reputable company that signed several new service agreements in the last 12 months. FD's customers are said to be very happy with their services. FD takes a unique approach by making an investment in their customers' businesses. What? And, and an investment. So, folks, this is like the equivalent of you doing your grocery shopping at a grocery store and a grocery store asking you to buy a part of your company or a buy a part of your house. So it's, it's a pretty bizarre, right? A unique approach. To me, I, I would call it bizarre, right? Here, I'll, I'll even say this is bizarre. Okay, um, I think it's weird. That's totally not normal. I don't know if anyone else f feels that way or not, but this doesn't really sit well with me. So right away, I'm thinking potentially this could be qualitative, right? This is a, a qualitative point for me to discuss. Um, and neither Shirley nor Adam had considered selling ownership interest in CHI. However, with no experience in merchandising and, and given the key role merchandising will play in the continued success of CHI, they believe they need to consider the option. To help assess whether FD is, is the right partner, Shirley and Adam want to test FD's controls. By the way, so here's our first AO. So I'm going to say AO1 is going to be the testing of the controls, right? So obviously, you're going to do it. CHI has gained a, a good reputation and last thing Shirley and Adam want are dissatisfied customers. So we have testing FD's controls as AO1. Now testing of the controls, remember we have to put it into somewhere so it's going to be probably assurance. On September 5th, 2019, Shirley and Adam held an initial meeting with Dwayne the partner in charge of the CHI engagement to present him with the details of the proposed agreement and seek his advice on whether they should proceed. They are in final stages of the negotiation and FD has been willing to provide additional information uh, to help Shirley and Adam reach their, their, their decision. Okay, it is now December 15th, 2019, calls you, calls you CPA, right? So you work, basically your role is your CPA work for CPA firm. Okay, 
then he says the following, while FDA and auditors acknowledge that a report on internal controls at a service organization w w w would be useful. By the way, what he means um, is a CSRE 3400. Uh, we can't do that here, but you kind of have an idea of what it is. Oh, sorry, 3416, CSRE 3416. That's what he means by this. Um, one cannot be completed in the required time frame. However, an interim solution FD has offered as part of the contract agreement to allow a CHI's representative access to FD's premises and records to review the relevant controls and processes. After discussion with Shirley and Adam, I've decided to carry out specified audit procedures to test the relevant controls. However, FD wants to approve a detailed listing of procedures beforehand. So by the way, you might want to just say, like, why is FD approving, right? Why is FD approving? Why are you not approving, right? This doesn't make any sense, right? If you're the one doing the due diligence, why is FD approving what can be done? I need, I need you to address a, a list of specified procedures. So remember, if you kind of go up here for a second, we have to test the controls, right? Here, it's also AL2 procedures. So this is going to be assurance again. Same processes are apparently used by FD for all its customers. I'd like you to provide Shirley and Adam with a description of the key processes and controls, including the general IT controls that are necessary. So folks, the above A01 with controls and key processes. I'm also going to add an A03 here for IT controls that are necessary in the circumstances based on the following, delivery, et cetera, ordering, warehousing, dist you know, like distributions, et cetera. Um, so that's gonna be AL3. Since I'm quite busy, I'd appreciate you drafting a separate memo to Shirley and Adam assessing FD's proposal. So here we're gonna say AL4 FD proposal. So probably it's going to be some something in finance. And then probably there's going to be an AL5 FD proposal, again, finance, but now we're going to do qualitative. So this guy up here is going to be qualitative, quantitative, okay? So you kind of have an idea of where the AOs are. That's what this stuff is, okay? So now we have a breakdown of what everything is, right? Uh, by the way, does everyone agree with me here? Does everyone agree with my AO allocation? Would anyone say anything else? Do you think I missed something? I, I always like to give an opportunity for someone to identify something. Do you think I missed something? Do you think it kind of, you know, is okay? Is it not? Are we sort of on the same page? Do we agree? in general, what this might be. Okay, just I just want to see whether people are on the same page as me so far or not. Okay, let me know in like in the chat. Um, so Okay, so, so far everyone says yes. Uh, there's one person that, that's saying that there's more at the beginning of the case. Um, let me know what you think. So what is it? What do you think it is? Which one is it? What else is missing? Uh, Marcus, AL1 is similar to AL2. I might have put them together. Um, I don't think so because here you have controls and here you have procedures. So procedures are, are oh, oh, sorry, AO1 and AO3. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think that a lot of people who would do this case would probably um, kind of lump these two together, the key processes with the general IT controls. The reason why I wanted to separate them is because one talks about key processes and other looks at general IT controls, which are like different. Okay, so to me, I find those to be different but um but yeah akbar um would it be better to call it a required or ao 
um, it's the same. It's really like a required is an AO Akbar. Um, there's no difference whatsoever. It's really the same idea. So you would do both. It, it doesn't matter. They're both the same idea. Anita, will we have the case on paper in the exam room? Yeah, you will. Yes, you will. So you can basically do this. You could do what I've just done. That's why it's important. Okay, so you kind of have an idea here. Um, so I'll just, you know, keep going. We have some numbers here, right? You could see that they're fairly profitable. Comedy hour excerpts, right? We, you know, we can see that their forecasted like revenues are really going up. They make a lot of money off of the show. Uh, we have some expenses, some uh, production stuff. Here's the actual offer itself. So I'm just going to skip through and, and look through what we have available. Okay, so we have a couple pages. One is this IT controls thing or, and, and key processes. One is Shirley and Adam's additional comments and then the FD offer. So um, someone's asking me, um, is CSRE part of our curriculum? Yes, it is. Um, in fact, Akbar, I cover the CSRE, uh, part of my special reports class. So if you've never heard it before, watch the special reports class. We have it available um, and we've ran this before. It is totally a requirement. It's actually not that complicated. Okay, um, Nikita, do we have to break down the AO? Um, you don't, it's just, I think it's kind of important because I think of it as like a giant AO and I like to break them up a little bit. You don't have to. If you saw it as one, then then that's fine too. As long as, long as you address them. Uh, someone's saying, I can't find a copy of the case. No, I'm going to upload everything at the end. So you'll, you know, you'll have everything, including all the answers, etc. Okay. Anyway, um, here's the first exhibit here, um, which is called the exhibit two. Um, FD has vast experience in merchandise product on, on the internet. We we understand inventory management and product availability are critical to the overall success of any outsourcing arrangement. FD works hand in hand with companies to arrange the manufacturing or importing, the warehousing, distribution of the products, and handles all the billings and, and the collections. Over the last two years, twenty new customers have benefited from our expertise. So basically, in two years, right, folks. Um, they've brought on 20 new customers. That to me seems pretty risky. It seems like it's a lot. And keep in mind, they buy shares in all the companies. So the way that I kind of see this is right away, I'm, I'm already seeing like pros and cons, right? Remember that there is a numbers portion, right? So this seems more like a qualitative. And then later on, we might have some quantitative somewhere. But so far I see this as, you know, potentially something that's qu qualitative, okay? Or or at least this, I'll say qualitative. FD agrees to purchase shares to be issued by CHI, re 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 representing a 20% ownership stake in CHI for $7 million in the cash on April 1, 2020. In addition, FD will, will receive a yearly management fee of 10% of CHI's total net income. Oh, wow. So they have to do 10% of the net income Plus, they, they lose 20% for $7 million. First of all, again, to me, I kind of see this as both like quant and qual, right? Because qual, it's like, uh, do you even need the $7 million? You sound like, you know, the company is pretty profitable. I don't think they need the $7 million. They seem to be doing very well. They have lots of retained earnings. So it's not like they're, they're, they're desperate for money. So the question is, you know, what do you want to sell? And then the, the quantitative basically tells you, you should, you know, decide and you should evaluate um, whether you kind of go here or not. Um, uh, Delphine um, is, is now also adding a comment that she feels like there's another AO, evaluate outsourcing decision. Um, so that's part of actually what I covered. That's one of the AOs that I covered. I, I just called it, finance, non-management accounting, but it could be one or the other. I believe that it's possible to actually have one or the other. So, you know, good eye, but it could be both. Okay. 
Um, okay, so they will provide the following services, develop the transactional portion of the Comedy Hour website so it can run with FD systems starting April 1, 2020, purchase warehouse, distribute inventory, provide billing, collection services on behalf of CHI, and CHI is responsible for marketing and advertising the, mer the merchandising component of the Comedy Hour website. FD will, will absorb all other costs, including um, processing and blah, blah, blah. So, okay, so this stuff again is quant, okay? And then upon request, um, as in the case with all FD partners are allowed an unaccompanied inspection of our premises. So obviously you don't want any unaccompanied inspection of anything because of risk. So right away, that's qual. Right, so it's pretty easy, right? We see a bunch of qualitative factors. We see some quantitative stuff. That's pretty simple so far. So we just slot it into our overall discussion. Exhibit three, since CHI will be responsible for our marketing and, and advertising component of the Comedy Hour website related to the, the merchandise, Shirley and Adam will hire two customer service reps. They start, here's your salary, et cetera. And then there's also an increase in, mar in marketing and advertising, so quant. Uh, general uh, like admin expenses uh use of the new website etc okay so more quant stuff rate of return quant and not to do with the seven million oh quant sorry and then what to do with the seven million so for now it, it could be for example qualitative plus quant for the the expected rate of return so if they don't know what to do with it, then that's qual, right? So you kind of have an idea of what we're doing here. Key processes, right? FD will be performing many of CHI's operations. We've provided a description. So purchasing, warehousing, distribution, customers will not be able to differentiate be like between the portions of the website managed by CHI and the transactional portion. The entire website will be perceived to be the website of Comedy Hour. So remember, this is like a pro and con discussion, right? So the risk here is reputation risk. Remember, they're not looking to make money. They're, they're looking to make sure that the reputation is wonderful. So if there are problems, right, it actually, for example, decreases the chance of them having a show continued on Netflix, right? So that's a weird thing to think about right so that's something that you kind of want to you know understand here in general okay okay um i hope that's kind of making sense um okay because fd has affiliations with other companies fd reserves the right to use chi's customer data to, to solicit sales for fd's other business partners which is crazy right that's a con we don't want them to use sales data for other business partners right that's a real problem right again a risk customers will conduct all ordering versus via the transactional website that fd will develop and manage now you see the reason why i wanted to to originally split one compared to another is this one talks more about like strictly IT controls like this one's an IT control and then this one is kind of like a con from signing with FD so so far you kind of have to filter in between to place an order customers will indicate number of units they in, they enter their credit card billing information they hit submit etc so again now we're dealing with IT control like it's all scrambled here Current inventory warehouse system se segregates product to be delivered, you know, daily shipments, 48 hours, et cetera. Again, okay, IT control. Warehousing system is equipped with just in time, um, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so again, IT control and also key processes. Okay, all inventory personnel have access to inventory management and GAT systems. If they notice variance, they make the adjustments as necessary. So that's more of a controls issue, right? So that's why I feel like there's kind of a difference between the IT controls and problems. 
So just be careful. That's why I thought that they were originally two separate AOs. Billing clerks are responsible for matching sales. They, uh, billing clerks issue refunds when customers return items. Um, so this potentially could be a process issue. Collections received from credit card companies directly deposited or customers paying by check. Okay, that's IT control. Receivable clerks match the receipts, so they're completed. That's process. Billing clerks have full access to, uh, to accounts receivable, subledger, cash uh, receipts, process, uh, uh, potentially failure, um, and then follow up with any items over 65 days. Okay, so process. IT controls, all data is encrypted, stored on a mainframe with all other service for all other partners. Mainframe is stored in a locked secure room near the president's office. So obviously it, this is a risk. Uh, program changes are conducted by in-house technicians who have full access to live production data. So we gotta be careful. We should never do any kind of um, production data live. And then all system uploads are conducted automatically. If something goes wrong, then uh, the system will page the IT manager for assistance who will respond as quickly as possible. So again, it's kind of like a process. Anyway, so you kind of see it. we're at the end of the, you know, uh, the actual case. So this is a really confusing, um, this is a really like, you know, like confusing exhibit. So, so someone's asking me in general, um, what is the difference be like between a process issue and, and a control issue? So in, in this case, um, I believe that, that there were two separate AOs, one where we had to describe the processes, right? The, the, the key processes and controls, and then some of the general IT, you know, the general IT controls. So the difference between them is one would be a key process, right? Like uh, of how um, a, a particular individual transaction is made, et cetera. The general IT controls is something that's, you know, for example, the storage, the access, the the encryption. Um, to me, it's kind of a separate portion, like, it, you know, it's a separate part of it. So I, I hope that kind of makes sense. The only reason why I've divided both areas is because I felt like they were trying to sort of ask for both. Okay. Um, so by the way, someone's asking me, do you have a summary of changes of, uh, like available? Yes, um, I've, I've also provided a session from from before. If, if you click through the recorded classes, there's already a curriculum update for 2019 that's been done. Okay, anyway, so folks, you kind of see like, there's a lot of information here. What I wanted to now show you is a couple of examples of how this can be tested and what actual students wrote. And we're not gonna, you know, we're not going to have time uh, to go through all these examples, but all I just wanna quickly do is I'd like to go through this spreadsheet here and I'd like to go through the levels and see whether we kind of got the levels or not. Okay, and then we can talk about more. So remember the levels are, we have to score average, which means that we can't miss any AOs. Um, we have to score a minimum number of C's, so like a reasonable mark, um, you know, breadth, depth, and then I guess all, you know, like all the other stuff. So let's now attempt to see whether we believe that this was covered or not in the cases that we're going to look at. Okay, so on your screen now, let me kind of run through a couple of examples. I'll upload them later. Feel free to go through them in more detail but I just wanna show you what actual responses look like. Okay, um, dear Shirley and Adam, here we have internal controls and, and applicable audit procedures. So remember, we were supposed to cover procedures, se segregation of duties, and here's an actual procedure to match a data integrity, uh, like inventory personnel, IT controls, et cetera. So you see like there's not a whole ton of information here uh, this this like particular person kind of rushed through the actual procedures and put them all together. Uh, they spent some some time discussing FD's offer, the quant, and the qual. 
and the conclusion. And then we've got some auto procedures in general again, even though we have auto procedures up here, which is kind of confusing because I think this person blended internal controls and auto procedures, whereas we're only supposed to do auto procedures or controls. So here we have to do auto procedures for FD and they are now only preparing, I guess, one procedure. So in general, I find this particular case to be fairly weak. So across all levels, A, we are missing AOs, um, B, there's not enough depth here. And this person totally misinterpreted what we even have to do. So be careful if, you know, if you're looking at this later, um, one best way of kind of doing better here is by clearly articulating the different AOs and then trying to discuss all of them. Here's a second example. We have a quantitative, um, we, we have a qualitative section, a lot more time. Um, there's a conclusion, so this looks pretty good so far. We have internal controls and auto procedure. So we have a couple of controls, right? And then the auto procedure that serves it. That's great. We have the IT controls, which are separate and we are missing everything else. So I would say that, that it's sort of okay. Um, but at least what I liked is this person tried to attempt everything available. So there's already a better response compared to what we saw in sample one. And then sample three, if we just quickly run through it, uh, we have some testing areas, inventory risk, et cetera. Um, IT, you know, area, customer data, so this is missing a lot. You see, this is poorly um, formatted. So it's pretty difficult to, to understand what this is. There's some computer error and downtime and potential deficiencies. So we've talked about deficiencies here and then a conclusion. But you see, there's no real indication of assessment opportunities. So it's really hard to read this. So I would say that they've attempted stuff because they have uh, procedures they have the IT stuff, uh, but they completely miss the actual report. R remember, we're supposed to do a whole report. So they are missing the report piece, but I've attempted everything else. Anyway, there's three samples just for you to kind of look at. I will make them available. I will upload them, of course. And then you have, you know, you'll have an idea of, of how people attempt to write this. In any case, all three people could use a little bit more help in terms of writing and you know if any of these responses kind of look like yours then feel free to you know reach out to us and let's work together to, to build a, a better response speaking of working to build a better response my suggestion is to to improve your debriefing skills and actually before i talk about debriefing i just want to answer a quick question that was asked before um i believe there is a question here from uh, marcus um if Marcus, let me know if this is if 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 this is correct or not. Um, earlier, you were asking about what's the easiest way to transition from a day three case to to a day two case. Um, in general, you have to get good at writing day three cases before you can transition. You know correctly to a day two case. So my advice is to first get really good at day three cases. And then all what a day two case is, is that it's a slightly longer day three case. So it's, in my opinion, something that's kind of straightforward. Um, in general, you probably just want to practice using um, time constraint. That's the, you know, uh, by far the biggest differentiator. And then another huge differentiator is proper debriefing. So the way that you get better is, is actually by taking up your answers. So here's how you do debriefing properly. Um, here's how you take up like the case files properly. So never rush through debriefing in general. Even if you have an opportunity to write in another case, you probably shouldn't. You should instead do like do the following. Read the answer guide, okay? So I will make an answer guide available to you. So if you actually kind of click here for a second, um, I will make an answer guide available. So here's an answer guide. You will have it available. Read the sample solutions. So I've given you now three. In your own paper, once you try it, see if you picked up on some of the issues, several or all, 
and review what you've missed. And then you can review potential technical. And my, and my suggestion, if you want to score well, you should always, you know, rewrite portions of the, of your response. If you rewrite in general, um, you will score a lot better uh, once you kind of, you know, go through through the whole process, okay? So proper debriefing is ultimately what will help you do better um, in the case writing process. Okay, and so that's pretty much it basically here. I just wanted to also explain a couple things. Um, be careful of what you hear in the next couple of months. Uh, CPA Canada uses a lot of facilitators which basically teach cases, but generally speaking, they're not markers. Um, just be careful to understand that markers are not facilitators and facilitators are not markers. So that's something that's uh, critical. Um, what's the logical plan for you to do? My suggestion for you to do one case per week up until the CFE. So your CFE Prep Plus uh, program will provide you with 14 credits for regular case writing. And my advice is to write, you know, say three, four cases yourself and then debrief one with your CPA marker. Okay, so essentially the, the uh, program has started. Um, this is the schedule that, uh, you know, that I would follow. And as the largest program in Canada, here's my plan of attack. Like you should be starting your case writing now, not July and do one case per week. Please also keep in mind that in addition to our weekly live classes, we have something called CFE Live, which is an intensive program all online. It's all recorded again and will be available up until the 2019 CFE. Here are the dates. Um, make sure that you don't miss it. Um, and in addition to all the, you know, the classes, you also have the one-on-one -on -one coaching um, with markers that starts immediately and um, you should be good to go, okay? That's basically pretty much it. Um, here's some more, in, more, you know, more information about our CV prep program. Uh, please note that our prices are increasing soon. Um, so feel free to, you know, to register if you'd like to get started with us. And um, that's pretty much it, folks. Um, that's all I wanted to say for today. Um, I think you can totally do it. I think I tried to explain, uh, just to summarize, I've tried to explain a lot about the overall topics that cons get tested. Um, I tried to show you an actual case. I tried to show you how to debrief, how to look at sample answers, how to look at um, how you write yourself, how to make sure that you understand how you can do better from a case writing perspective. And uh, the rest is now up to you. It's to practice additional cases going forward. Okay, so I think that that's critical. Um, so, uh, by the way, if you have any questions at all, I'm going to provide my contact details. If you ever want to connect, uh, I would be happy to assist. Let me actually see if there's any questions here. Um, so, uh, by the way, Marcus, please let me know if you have any follow-up questions. Um, Nikita is asking about an exam blueprint. Um, the exam blueprint basically um, gives you, um, I think you're talking about the competency map. Basically, it explains what you can be tested on. Um, instead of focusing on something like that, which is a very generic document, my suggestion is not to focus on that and instead to look at the document that I provided earlier, right? Like that Excel spreadsheet, because that's what you might find again on your on your exam. Remember, it's the same topics that constantly get tested. So um, just be careful, right? My job is to help you understand um, how the process works. Okay, Binesh, um, what cases do you recommend with the limited time available? Um, well, the key here is to write as many cases as, as possible. You don't have limited time. It's April and you have all the way till September. So it's not really limited time. It's just, you know, um, I guess, um, yeah. So I'm, I, I'm gonna say it's still totally possible. Uh, James, is there a webinar session on uh, day one? Um, yeah, there will be one available. Um, we currently are working to build the materials for it um, and more information will follow. Okay, so more information will follow by email, so please stay tuned. Um, we will have something available to you and we will announce it by email as soon as it is available. Okay, great. 
Shanka, if your elective is not taxation, what tax topics do you recommend to study? Um, Shanka, I answered this question earlier. You can look through through the spreadsheet that I will upload. Uh, take a look at the last four years and you should have a really good understanding of what to study under breadth. So if you look through breadth, you'll have an idea. In general, it's probably very similar topics. Okay, so you have to know a lot. But that spreadsheet will help you. And most important, Shanka, is you have to practice. You have to practice like using cases. You should get a bunch of cases marked professionally. Um, it will really help you do better. Okay, folks, um, that's pretty much it from my end tonight. Um, if you have any additional questions, feel free to reach out. Um, so, someone saying, I thought secure exam is being I thought CPA is getting rid of secure exam that's correct it's already gone um, Marcus you looked over the answers and pointed out what's wrong could you give some pointers on what you like to see in examples yeah Marcus uh, Marcus check out my webinars on Rodak you will see a lot more I've kind of scratched the surface here tonight um, take a look at my Rodak ones if you just type in Rodak in, in the search bar above, you'll find a bunch of them. Um, and um, you should basically check them out. Okay, you'll find a lot more you know more information here. Um, Himandri, is there a plan, a study plan for internationally trained students and working students? Yeah, of course. So your marker, Himandri, will build you a study plan. So please, if you're currently uh, a a prep formula student reach out to your marker and they will make one available for you and they will build one based on what your needs are. Uh, Meghna, um, webinar on day one, when will it be done? It's not announced yet. There's no information right now. So we, uh, yeah, I can't, I can't comment. Um, as I mentioned, it's not yet available and you will hear back by email. Um, about when it's going to be. Okay, folks, um, again, thank you very much for attending this uh, class uh, this evening. I know I have to compete with Netflix and a bunch of other cool shows. Um, luckily, I don't do this at the same time as Game of Thrones. Otherwise, I'd probably lose. Um, thank you all, folks, um, and we'll see you all on Thursday. I hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.